we're going to make a start in a moment or two, so if you could find a seat, that would be really helpful. Um, Good morning, everybody. Very warm welcome to you on this uh, slightly chilly morning. If you're feeling the heat, you can look around at some of our folks who are wandering around in flip-flops and shorts as if it was broad summer. Um, but it's great to be here and to meet together in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you've not met me before, uh, my name is Steve Short. I'm the curate here. A little bit later in our service, our vicar Dan McGowan will be preaching for us from chapter 1 in Hebrews as we begin our new Bible teaching series. Uh, two things just to let you know at the beginning. Uh, the first one is that all of our young people's groups are working this morning, so we have Croche, we have Sparklight, and we have Laser. I'll let you know at the relevant time uh, to go out for those. Uh, and also to say that we are going to be sharing the Lord's Supper this morning, which is a great joy. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but if it is your normal custom to uh, come to the Lord's table, if you're trusting the Lord Jesus as your Saviour and Lord, then you're very welcome to join us at the Lord's table and to celebrate in the supper together. Well, let's just take a, a moment of quiet and then we'll pray together the prayer of preparation which will come up on the screen. Together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're uh, beginning a, a new preaching series this morning in the book of Hebrews, uh, a book all about how much better Jesus is than anything that was offered under the old covenant. Jesus is everything, isn't he? And so the writer says, uh, don't turn back to the old covenant and all of its religious demands, but fix your eyes on Jesus. And that's a theme that's picked up in our first hymn that we're going to sing together, You're the Word of God the Father. So can I invite you, if you're able, to uh, stand, and as the music begins, let's sing together.
Father God, we thank you that you are the author of creation. We thank you that you are leading us as sinners home and for the glorious hope that there is, that there is a home to go to in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, do please uh, take a seat and uh, we're going to have our first Bible reading now. It's from Psalm 110. So grab a Bible and Sheila is going to read it for us. The reading can be found on page 613. Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy majesty. From the womb of the dawn you will receive the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook beside the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're going to be seeing more of Psalm 110 as we go through our series in Hebrews, particularly verses 1 and 4 are quoted often throughout that book, and you'll see why as we progress through it over the coming weeks. Well, as we come to our weekly practice of confessing our sins to God, it's good to be reminded of what the Lord Jesus said about the law. He said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Well, you and I both know, don't we, that we have failed, even today, in one way or another, whether in our hearts or our minds, our souls and our strength, that we've not served the Lord as we should. So it's right that we come to him in confession. Let's just take a moment of quiet to reflect in our own hearts back over the past week, the things that we know we want to bring to the Lord as we confess. So we pray together the words on the screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Some words from Hebrews chapter 10. By his will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. 
But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The collect for today. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, as uh, forgiven people, it's wonderful that we can sing with confidence and joy about who we are in Christ, because nothing compares to what we have in him. We have forgiveness of sins. We have the assurance of eternal life that goes way beyond this life. And of course, because of that, we have a deep joy in the Lord Jesus today, here and now. So as we, uh, as we hear the music begin, let's stand and sing together, My Jesus, My Saviour. Well, it's time for our children and young people's groups to head off out. We have creche for uh, babies and preschoolers, our primary school children in Sparklight, and our other young people in Year 7 Plus in Laser. 
Um, as they head off out, let me pray for them. Father God, thank you so much for each and every one of our children and young people. And we pray for them, Father, as they go, those that want to, to their groups. Lord, as they engage with the Bible, as they look more into trusting the Lord Jesus, please would you help them to do that and know him as their own saviour. And we pray for their teachers, those spending time with them, Lord, that they would really witness to the joy of knowing the Lord Jesus. And we pray it for his precious name. Amen. Amen. Great. Have a wonderful time out there, folks. We look forward to seeing you coming back later to join us in the Lord's Supper. Um, we've got a few notices today, and uh, before I begin the notices, it's my pleasure and privilege to read uh, some bands of marriage. For Neil and Becca, we know them here. Oh, Neil and Becca here today. Oh, hi, Becca. Welcome. Neil's working, the hard lot of a detective, eh? Even on a Sunday morning. I publish the bands of marriage between Neil Richard Buzzard and Rebecca Amy Kate Underwood, both residents of the parish of St. Paul's and to be married at St. Paul's. This is for the first time of asking if any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. Wonderful. Let's uh, pray for them, shall we, as they prepare for their wedding. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Neil and Becca and for bringing them to, bringing them to this point where they will be getting married to each other. And Lord, as they prepare for their marriage in a few weeks' time, would you bless them? Would you draw close to them? And Father, I pray that as they make their preparations for living as man and wife, that you would be right at the centre of those plans and preparations. And as they live together, Father, that you would be the centre of their household. Father, pour out your blessing on them, we pray, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Wonderful. Great to have that wedding coming up. And so a few notices. Uh, one for the men. Uh, we had hive for the women recently. This is for men. If you fancy a game of tennis, um, there's going to be some summer Thursday evenings in Bloxham playing tennis. And um, I'm told by Mike that all standards are welcome. So I guess that means if you can hold the bat, Oh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, but anyway, do have, uh, do have a chat with Mike Moore afterwards if you would like to get involved in that. There's a possibility of well, or as well um, related to that of gathering together afterwards in the pub, even if you don't go for tennis, just to enjoy fellowship together. Again, Mike will give you more details about when that's happening and what you need to know. Uh, the other thing to mention uh, is that this week is our regular monthly parish prayer meeting. It will be from 8 o'clock until 9 o'clock, meeting in the church centre at Prescott Avenue. And so grow groups on the whole won't be, won't be meeting this week. Um, we encourage you to come and join us if you possibly can to pray together about the needs of our church, our world and our church family. Uh, the other thing to share with you is that next weekend we have our mini mission up at Bretch Hill, um, based around our uh, service at the Sunshine Centre. Um, first event for you to be thinking about and praying about is our quiz night on Friday, 8 o'clock at the Sunshine Centre. Uh, and it's a great event to invite somebody to, um, primarily uh, aimed at our folks uh, up on the estate from the 5 o'clock, but not exclusively limited to them. And I did want to share it with you this morning so that even if you can't come, perhaps you could pray that God will be at work in the hearts of people who are invited to come. We know of at least four people who are coming who don't normally come to church and as far as we know, don't know the Lord yet. Uh, so do pray for that. There'll be a short talk on who is Jesus and why should I care. 
then on Saturday afternoon, um, we have, oh, by the way, for each of these things, I have a, a little thing if you want to take it away to remind you to pray or to give to somebody as you invite them. On Saturday afternoon, we have the big litter pick. We did this in January and it was really successful. It was great fun. Um, the chap from the council, Steve, who came to pick up the rubbish, was amazed and struggled to get it all in the van. He said, I should have brought a pickup truck. Um, it's a, a good way for us to serve our community and a good thing to invite somebody to join you, a neighbour or a friend who doesn't come to church. And there will be cake at the Sunshine Centre after that and drinks uh, and a short talk, who is Jesus and how does he clear up the world's mess? So do be praying about those events and uh, support them if you are able to and would like to. Um, that's it from me. I'm going to ask Dan to come up with a notice. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, let me add my welcome to, you, to Steve's. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to one of the notes we put in the news sheet this week, um, that we've had some really good news recently. We mentioned this at the AGM. Thank you for those who came to the uh, annual meeting. It was a, a really good and positive and encouraging event. Um, we recently applied to the diocese, to their development fund, to help us fund a full-time minister over the next three years who we are, want to set apart to plan our church plant and then to execute the plan to lead it. Uh, and we've recently learnt that the application has been successful. Um, we asked for and we were given £61,000. Uh, this is to be spread over three years and will make up quite a large part of what we're hoping to raise to fund this, this full-time role. So we're really excited and we're really grateful to God for that provision. And we're continuing to pray for, um, there are funds coming from other um, avenues as well, and we've made a couple, of, we're going to make a, another application or two. But we're, we're very much on the way, and we're looking forward to soon advertising for someone to start uh, this role in the summer. Um, so that's really, really exciting, and really um, um, something for our thanksgiving and prayers as we go forward. So I just wanted to share it with all of us. Do pass it on if you're um, sitting having a coffee with someone who didn't make it this morning, uh, and we can praise God together um, as we go forward. Back to Steve. Actually, no, let's pray. Silly Billy. Father God, thank you very, very much for your love. Thank you that you uh, have great plans for us, plans to prosper, to build, uh, to um, call people to yourself. And please use us, we pray. And thank you for this gift, uh, this provision, that we can plan to um, plant a new congregation on Bretch Hill and reach those who have not heard that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we praise and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Great, really encouraging news. Um, can I invite you to take your Bibles? And um, Richard is going to come and read to us from Hebrews chapter 1. Then Dan's going to preach. Thanks, Richard. So the reading is from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And you can find that in your Bibles on page 1201. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. This is the word of the Lord.
Wonderful. Let's pray. Our Jesus, our Saviour, there is none like you. Nothing compares to the promises we have in you. Lord, please teach us more of that incomparable nature of yours as we sit under your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've got a picture to show you. Um, Mary is married to Jeff, and she has been a Christian most of her life, brought up in a Christian home, always been a churchgoer. And in the last few years, she has been busy bringing up children. It's been hard work, but she's just about kept her head above the water. However, in recent years, um, things have got a little bit different. She's found it difficult to engage on a Sunday, and she's often tired. Jeff, her husband, made, was made unemployed three years previously, and they've been struggling to make ends meet. Mary managed to find a part-time job and has really clicked with the women that she's working with. They're funny and they're fun. And when she had an opportunity to share that she was a Christian, she found it strange that she didn't. She realized that she didn't want to spoil this new friendship and how things were. And besides, their lives of the friends seemed so fulfilled. Soon they were helping uh, Mary with her childcare and inviting her on activities on the weekend and church became less of priority. Life just seemed that little bit easier. In order to avoid challenging questions, she stopped going to her home group. And before long, her attendance at church was functional. Her husband, Jeff, carried on going regularly, taking the children. But as a quieter and more reflective person, uh, it had always been um, carried along by Mary. And so he was now unsure what to do. Then meet Tom. Tom is uh, a middle-aged husband with two children. He became a Christian six years ago. And initially, life was very exciting. He got increasingly involved with the local church, um, even being invited onto the eldership last year. His family were concerned with his newfound faith, but they tried to show sympathy and hoping it was just a phase he was going through. But it did affect his close relationships. Then amongst the church leadership, there was a controversy over finance, and his pastor, Jim, quickly resigned. And within a fortnight, Tom left the congregation. He was rightly uh, gutted about Jim, he, who had been so instrumental to Tom uh, becoming a Christian. But now everything seemed a bit fake. He blamed God for the disruption in the church. And he actually found it quite easy to step away. And finally, he found, suddenly he found he was freed up of all these various responsibilities. He had more time for himself. It felt good. And his family were delighted. And they showed it. And Tom enjoyed the new warmth and acceptance at home. Well, today we begin a new sermon series in the book of Hebrews, and it's written to address those sort of situations that we've been hearing about. It was written probably in the 60s AD, uh, 25 years or so um, after Jesus had died and risen again. And it's written particularly to Jewish Christians, those from the Jewish faith, they've been convinced of Christ as the promised Messiah and put their trust in him. But as a result, life had become increasingly difficult. Not only were they ostracized from their families, their traditional communities that were so loving and warm, but they were becoming more persecuted by Rome, the state, and therefore by the general population. And as these Jewish Christians, they were beginning to look back at their old ways. Fondly, they'd seen what was so good about what they'd left behind, the, the old covenant. Um, the warmth and the, 
and the fellowship among their old bro Jewish brothers and sisters, they were beginning to drift. And the writer to the Hebrews sees this danger and he writes passionately to them to convince them not to go back, not to return to the old ways, but to, to come closer to the Lord, to come home to Jesus. So for that reason, we might call Hebrews a letter. Uh, it's an unusual letter. It hasn't got the traditional greetings at the start, giving us the name of who's writing and the people he's writing to. But instead, the writer launches into this urgent description of the power and glory of the Lord Jesus. It's odd, or different, I should say. And as we go into the book of Hebrews, it reads more like a sermon, a sermon than a letter. And if we go to the back of Hebrews, don't worry about doing it now, I've put it on a slide, it says this, brothers, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. I have written to you briefly. Huh. Well, an exhortation is a talk you would normally have at a synagogue meeting after the scriptures have been read, a bit like a sort of explanation. And our verses this morning are like an introduction. And then from verse 5 onwards of chapter 1, he proves his teaching by quoting all sorts of scripture. But who is writing this exhortation, this sermon? Well, there is much written about who it might be, but actually no one knows. But what is clear from this letter is that he knows his readers intimately. In chapter 6, we find out he knows all about their faith, the love they have for Jesus, the love they have for his people, and how they've actually stood firm in the face of persecution in the past. So he's a brother, a pastor, he's a friend, he's writing to people he cares about, but he's also writing, as I said, with this deep concern. They're beginning to drift away from the faith. Look back at the, old, the good old days, as they would think of it. And you only have to go to the bottom of the page, chapter 2, verse 1, to see this. Therefore, we must pay more attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. He loves them, but he has hard things to say, which is proper love, isn't it? But it is like that, isn't it? Most don't wake up one day and decide that Jesus is a lie. Bit by bit, they just come off the boil. They get distracted by other things, and spiritually, they kind of nod off. And eventually, some do even renounce the faith they once had. And brothers, we're, we're, all, we're all susceptible to this. We're all susceptible. And so here in this sermon, the writer wants to grab us, and Mary and Tom, the readers in the first century, and turn them back to Jesus. Turn them away from the direction they're going in. He wants them back in the race, the Christian walk. And perhaps you know the famous cry of Hebrews 12, let us throw everything off that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the, fate, the race marked out for us. It's a race, it's a marathon. So let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. That's the author's intention, but how does he do this? How do you and I, uh, on noticing a Christian friend who might be drifting, how might we call them back? Well, let's find out. And as mentioned, we have in the first four verses of the sermon, the introduction to his sermon. It's absolutely extraordinary. The rest of the book is built on these words. And in sum, what he's saying is, just look. Just look at how amazing Jesus is. Just look. How on earth could anyone settle for anything else? Jesus, well, there's no one that can compare. There's nowhere else to go. And then from here, all the way through to chapter 10, the author lines up everything that is so impressing these people and turning them back to Judaism, their old ways. 
you know, whatever it might be, the, the covenant, the practices, the Mosaic law. And he puts them up against Jesus. He compares them with Jesus, and Jesus blows everything out of the water. Whether it's the law, whether it's the priesthood, the sacrifices, all of it. He shows them that these were just the foothills, the, a rough sketch of what it was all leading to. The supreme son, the Lord Jesus, nothing compares to him. So Mary, Tom, um, as we begin, listen to this. Verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Hold on a minute. Did you hear that? God spoke. God has spoken. We have a speaking God, the God who made everything, put the stars in the sky. He's spoken, revealing himself to us. And that's what we need. So often we find ourselves confused, in the dark, searching for truth, but God has spoken, and that changes everything. But if I'm hearing that God has spoken, I've got to ask myself, am I listening? Am I listening? God is not silent. He's a speaking God, and he does so in two distinct phases here. Firstly, he speaks in the past. Did you see that? Long ago, in the past, he spoke to our forefathers, but also in these last days. Finally and emphatically, today. So that first phase in the past is what we find in the Old Testament. God calls himself a people. He speaks to them by his prophets, by the messengers, the mouthpieces. And the great voices in the Old Testament are people that we look up to. They're amazing. Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so on, all speaking on God's behalf over hundreds of years as his representatives. And first four, angels as well. They get mentioned, don't they? In Acts 7, in Galatians 3, we learn that the Old Testament law was given to, the, to Moses via, via angels. So angels in the Old Testament were held in high esteem. But verse 1, God spoke many times through them in various ways, did you see verse 1? So in visions, in dreams, a burning bush here, a pillar of fire there. Um, do you remember, he even spoke through a donkey. Numbers 22, it's a great story. In many ways, and that could read in many pieces, like a giant jigsaw puzzle, many different clues and truths scattered about the place, showing us who God is, how we come to him. So he, in the past he spoke, but verse 2, in these last days, this second phase, he has spoken to us by his son. It is as though now all those jigsaw pieces have been gathered up into one place, into one single magnificent picture of Jesus. All that's come before has been superseded because 2,000 years ago, into history stepped the Son of God. He becomes the ultimate spokesperson for God the Father. It's a bit like, or a tiny bit like, a White House press conference. We see them on our televisions a lot, don't we? And various minions come out and say something on behalf of the president, and the press are listening. But imagine, one by one, these little minion press officers come in and say something, but then the president walks in. What's going to happen to the press? They're not going to, they're going to stop listening to the minions. The president is here, and all the microphones are going to go under his nose. Jesus comes as the ultimate spokesperson for his father, God. And I have to ask you, are you listening to him? Feel the force of what the author is saying to his Jewish readers and to Mary and Tom that we met at the beginning. Do you understand what you're doing by turning away, by turning back to Moses and so on? You're disregarding the son, the one that Moses was pointing to. It's a bit like having a building project 
perhaps for a, I don't know, a brand new church hall. And we have the pictures, we have the drawings laid out before us. So we get a real sense of what it might look like one day. And then the day comes and the building is finally there. How much better is the real thing to all those pictures and sketches and drawings? How much better? Well, God is a speaking God. He has spoken fully and finally in this better son. And that word, that phrase, last days, we know that, I think, from Revelation. It's the time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And the speaker of Hebrews, he's saying, look, in these days, in our days, Jesus, he's been with us recently, hasn't he? And all these amazing things have happened as he's spoken to us in his son. But he's also speaking to us. We are still in these last days. Jesus is yet to return. Like the readers of the Hebrews, we are waiting for the return of Christ. And he's spoken fully and finally in his son, in our day. What a privilege it is to live in this day, to be spoken to by the the living God. So who is this Jesus that God has spoken through? Why should the world stop when Jesus enters the room? Well, says the writer, fix your eyes on this. This is the Jesus that God has spoken through. And I'm going to quickly go through the next couple of verses. Um, It's a breathtaking CV of the Son of God, explaining why... He's the ultimate revelation of God. Verse 2, he is the heir of all things. And we know what an heir is. It's someone who can say, one day all this will be mine. And the writer is saying that one day everything will belong to Jesus. I was reading yesterday that Elon Musk is worth 173.6 billion US dollars. Yes, he can pay his household fuel bills. But this is loose change to the Son of God, who is the heir and rightful owner of all things. Um, Jeff Bezos, Amazon, the city of London, the UN, the nations of the world, all the galaxies of this universe, all belong to Jesus. They all have stamped on them property of the Son. And the trajectory of human history All universal history is that everything is being brought to the feet of the rightful owner, which is Jesus. And it's a question that we need to be asking. Who's in charge? And it's a key question. Well, here, the message is what Jesus is. So he must now be, can't be relegated to the the margins of my life, which I so like to do, to put him in that box marked Sunday or religion or my spirituality that's not right is it he's the heir of everything everything belongs to jesus and that gives us a really new perspective on what i have my bank balance belongs to him my possessions my home my career whatever it is it all belongs to him he is the heir and the writer says rightly so because verse 2 he created he made everything The sun was there at the dawning of time. God spoke. Jesus, the word, created. The voice goes out. And Colossians 1 tells us, by him, by Jesus, all things were created. We forget that, don't we? Or did he just think he was some sort of moral teacher? He created all things. Look at verse 3. He is the radiance of God's glory. In the Bible, God's glory is that bright, shining, pure, uh, blinding purity of God, the holiness of God. And his son is all those things as well. God's glory once manifests itself in the temple, in the tabernacle. Well, that's now Jesus. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we saw his glory, say the disciples. Not so much Jesus, meek and mild, or the hippie that wants us to love everything. 
He's the radiance of God's glory, the image of his power, the word of his power. And he is spotless, the essence of goodness and purity. From him, the beams of light, the warmth and the brilliance of God emits. So a friend might say to you, well, I think of God as X, or I think of God like this. No. Look at Jesus if you want to know what God is like. Don't make it up on your own. And verse 3 says he is the exact representation of God's being. He's the imprint of God's nature, his, his character. If you want to know what God looks like, it's Jesus. Look at him. And that was Jesus' claim. He said these things, didn't he? I and the Father are one. If you look at me, you meet the Father. And people were astonished and outraged by that. That's why he ended up on a cross. But he proved it. He did extraordinary things. He calmed the storm with a word. He healed. He even called outside a tomb of a friend four days after he had died and said, come out. And he did. So I hope no one here is under the illusion that he's just some Palestinian rabbi who said some interesting things that we need to think about. No, he's the son of God. And we cannot ignore him. Verse 3, he's also the sustainer. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. God said, let there be, mm, and Jesus says, let there continue to be. If you're taking notes, read Psalm 104 later and see God sustaining creation. That's Jesus' job. He gives constant attention to the universe. And will it crumble and fall if he doesn't? No. Worse than that, if he stops sustaining the universe by his word, we would instantly blink out of existence. We rely on him for every nanosecond of the day, every breath that we breathe, every heartbeat of the person sitting next to you. Sustained by his word. Whether we acknowledge it or not. He wrote the laws of nature. Planets obey him. Galaxies obey him. Little ants do his bidding. The Son is the sustainer of all things, and he is our Savior. We almost missed that, didn't we, in verse 3? After making purifications of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We've been reminded this morning that God has revealed himself. We can know him personally. But we have this barrier of sin, don't we? We've, we've all pushed God away. We've treated him as a footnote. We've put him in that Sunday box. And when we do that, there's this dreadful separation from him. And we desperately need someone to come and make it right again. Well, Jesus stooped down into our world gloriously. And he came to deal with our wretchedness. He didn't leave it to one of his minions. No, he rolled up his sleeves and did the job himself. He came, and on the cross, all the grime, all the stains, all the, all the waste of our sin was dumped on him. The one who was always in perfect relationship with his father was cut off from his father so that we may not be. And he dresses us with perfection, with purity, with cleanness. And verse 3 we read, he sat down. In other words, he finished the job. He's done everything necessary to save us. Do you like sitting down after a long day? I do. Perhaps you've been asked to look after the grandchildren or some children for a friend or a neighbor, and it's been exhausting. You've fed them, played with them, took them to the park, fed them again. You've settled them down. You've put them in the bath. You've scrubbed them. You've got them into bed. You've read them a story turn the light off and what do you do next you sit down it's done it's complete the work is done and that is exactly the sense of this word here this phrase he sat down nothing else is needed if we trust in christ nothing more needs to be done our sins past present future are dealt with 
doesn't depend on us gloriously. And it doesn't depend on Jesus doing anything else. He has sat down. The sacrifice has been paid. And we'll be coming to the supper soon. And we're taking the bread and the wine. And as we trust in him, we are assured that he has made the purification for my sin. I am clean before the Lord God. Because Jesus has sat down. So what is this writer saying? Well, he's saying what's written on that banner, isn't he? The banner that we put together to, to honour our, uh, our friend, our pastor, Edward. That Jesus is everything. Edward learnt that over the years. Jesus is everything. Everything. Why would you want to go anywhere else? Do you remember John 6? Jesus had taught those difficult truths about being the bread of life, God himself, and the crowds began to leave him despite the miracles. Everyone was leaving him. And he turned to his disciples and said, are you going to go as well? And Peter speaks for them and says, Master, there's, there's nowhere else we can go. You have the words of eternal life. You're the one. Jesus is everything. There's nowhere else to go. And remember my dodgy illustration about the new church hall. Here we have our new church hall, the thing that all those drawings and pictures and prayer meetings were all about. But wouldn't it be foolish, utterly absurd, to turn our backs on our new building, the fulfillment of all those drawings and things, and then just go and huddle around the pictures? I think, oh, isn't that nice? It's a flawed illustration. But throughout Jesus, uh, Hebrews, we've got this resounding message that Jesus is better. He is better. Uh, but what about my job? He is better than your job. What about my lovely new car? He's better. I know it's trivial, but he's better. He's better than anything else, anyone else. To reject Jesus is to push away the purification of sin, to push away his salvation. It's like being in a wide, wide ocean, treading water, losing strength, and the lifeboat finally comes, and he says, come on, come in, and you say, no thanks. Chapter 2, verse 3 says, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? So if you've not done that, if you've not jumped into the lifeboat, trusted in Jesus, turn back to him saying, sorry for your sins, come into my life. If that's you, I'm so pleased you're here, but listen to his words. Do something about it. Accept the lifeboat because you're sinking and you need to come to him. And dear friends, You've put your trust in the living God. If you've done that, yes, life can be hard. It can be a bit like Mary's. We get weary, and we are weary. Things are hard at the moment. It's a grueling, daily marathon of a race. Well, keep going. We're listening here. Keep going. It's worth it. Shake off the things that are clinging to us and getting us down. Do not be dazzled by the things that you see, tempting to take you away. Instead, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on our glorious Lord Jesus. And as we study this book this term, let us challenge each other to, to pray more, that we'll have this fresh vision of him, that he would grow in our hearts, be that radiance of the Lord. And because of what we see in him, we will be strengthened for this race. It will be worth it to keep going, urge forward, until we see him face to face. Let us daily praise his name, the word of God, our prophet, our priest and king, who has provided the purification for sins and has sat down, where? At the right hand of his father in heaven. Let me pray. Our loving God, we, we are in awe of your majesty and love that you stepped into our world and you've beckoned us to yourself where else could we go you are everything and we love you
Lord, please use these weeks to grow our hearts that we would see more and more and more of your majestic Son. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us just be quiet now and just pray to our God. Loving Heavenly Father, creator and sustainer, we come to you humbly with our prayers. You who are holy, we who are so sinful, yet loved by you so much that you sent Jesus to die in our place. We come to you praising your name and in repentance, for we know that we have sinned and you are so perfect. Thank you that Jesus shows us what you are like. He who was the image of the invisible God, who has the words of eternal life. Thank you that because of Jesus, we can come into your presence and worship you and talk to you, knowing that you will listen to us. Please help us to give you the praise and honour you are due. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glory your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your word, loving Father, is unchanging. We give thanks for those who attended the GAFCON conference this week and for their humility. With them we repent for what we have done that is not obeying your word. We pray for our bishops as they read the commitment from the conference and humbly ask that it would penetrate their hearts and you can use it to bring them back to the truth of your word. We pray for the delegates of the conference as they look to the future of the worldwide faithful Anglicans. With them, we commit ourselves into your hands, our loving Heavenly Father, having confidence that you will fulfill every promise with, even with the time of pruning and that the church will be built. With them, we say, to whom shall we go? We go to Christ, who alone has the words of eternal life, and then, with Christ, we go to the whole world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for Mike Reeves and the ministry you've given him. We pray for union as they give Bible-based theological training to the next generation of church leaders. We also pray for the churches who are being planted in Sweden and Greece. Thank you for the vision that Union has in equipping people in their own countries to do this. We pray for Mike as he heads up Union, that you will give him the wisdom and skills he needs. We pray for that, that financial support will be there so that the work can continue. We also pray that you will give Mike the rest he needs and time with his family. We pray for Bethan, Lucy and Mia, and especially ask that you would help Mia to be able to fight off infections and become stronger each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we thank you that here at St Paul's we are led by those who regard the Bible as the inspired word of God and teach it faithfully. We pray for Dan, Steve and Jeanette, that you will hold on to them when it is hard 
and keep them close to you, rooted in your word. We pray for the PCC and those on the diocesan synod that they will be wise in their decisions and brave to speak your truth when others are not. We ask that each of us here who love you will support them and in our daily lives be faithful in how we live so that we might be light and salt here in Banbury. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, when you created the world, you made it perfect. Yet we have sinned and turned from you. And now we see hatred in your world, and so wars. We pray for the fighting in Sudan, and ask that there will be a ceasefire that sticks, and the negotiation that bring results. We pray for the Christians in Sudan who are being affected by the fighting, and ask that you would bring, be with them and give them your peace. We continue to pray for the war in the Ukraine and ask that you will bring peace in this country. For closer to home, we know friends and family who are sick in body and mind, and we ask that you will lay your healing hand on them and meet their needs as you know best. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor seats in the, sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Wonderful. Well, we've had a real feast of God's word this morning, haven't we? The joy of who the Lord Jesus is. And as we sing this next song, it's a song we sometimes sing before uh, we've heard God's word read and preached, but it's also equally relevant afterwards, isn't it? We're going to pray through this song that the Lord will utterly transform our lives, that God's word will bury itself deep, deep, deep in our hearts, and uh, it will transform everything we do as a result. So do, as the, music uh, as the music begins, please stand and we'll sing together, prepare our hearts, O God.
Well, welcome back to our young folk who've come to join us as we share in the Lord's Supper together. Uh, just a reminder, as I said earlier, that uh, yeah, do please take a seat. Um, a reminder that we welcome everybody to the Lord's table who knows and loves the Lord Jesus. And if you're visiting with us and it's your normal custom to receive the Lord's Supper in your own church, then do feel free to come and join us at the Lord's table. Of course, if you prefer not to receive the Lord's Supper but would like to come forward for prayer, just keep your hands down. Um, and maybe just say, please pray, and then I'll pray for you. Uh, we'll have two uh, stations for receiving the supper here at uh, the rail at the front and also over on the right-hand side. And so perhaps if you're sitting over towards that side uh, and possibly nearer to the back, come down the side aisle and receive at the, the station at the side just there. And uh, as the stewards uh, direct you, uh, do follow their instructions and everything will run smoothly. And if, as they come to you, uh, you're not able to come forward and would like us at the end to bring the supper to you, then just let the stewards know and we'll bring it to you where you are. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Uh, why don't you just very briefly share a, a, a greeting in the name of Christ, perhaps say, the peace of the Lord be with you, just with those around and about you nearby. Wonderful. Well, let me call you back to order. Do continue those conversations after the service finishes. Hear what St. Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, 
according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Well, as we prepare to come to the table, remembering the wonderful Lord Jesus we've been hearing about, we pray together the prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We draw near with faith to receive the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you, preserve you.
Those words again from Hebrews 1. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so we pray together the prayer after communion. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, just an invitation to stay and enjoy refreshments after the service and fellowship with one another. And a reminder that our five o'clock service will happen as usual up at the Sunshine Centre. Well, we're going to um, draw our service to a close by singing, God has spoken by Christ Jesus. Christ, the everlasting Son, brightness of the Father's glory with the Father ever one. So do stand and let's sing together, God has spoken. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for all that we have heard of him this morning. Our creator, our saviour, our sustainer. 
the word spoken. Thank you, Father, that you have spoken to us through the Lord Jesus. And so we pray as we go into the coming week, whatever it holds in store for us, that we might constantly fix our eyes on him, the radiance of your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.